I'm demorphing, David cried. No, I roared, you'll be crushed inside this duct. What a beautiful sentence. Welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews, I'm Judith and you are watching another episode in my Animorphs series where I review every single book in the Animorphs series, except for the spin-offs. I'm not doing them. I last left you at the end of Animorphs April with a fairly hefty cliffhanger and the first book in the David trilogy or Dave trilogy. I'm not sure. Let's say the David trilogy. It's been a few weeks and I'm excited to be continuing on at last. We are going to continue on from the previous book which left us on a bit of a cliffhanger. So if you haven't checked out the playlist already, please go and do that now. Today I'm recapping Animorphs 21, The Threat, which is a title that would apply to pretty much every single book in this series so far, given the amount of escalating peril. But there is a dog on the cover, so we're all good. Look at the dog, isn't the dog cute? Don't look at that, look at the dog. We open right where we left off, except in Jake's perspective, with the Animorphs in cockroach morph falling out of a plane thousands of feet in the air. I say plane, blade chip. Plane will do. Debating demorphing and doing some very quick maths in their head to work out the physics of changing their mass while they're mid-fall, but they don't need to worry about that because Tobias and Rachel, who were not in the plane, swoop in in bird morph and snatch them out of the air. With certain death avoided, I mean I'm not ruling out uncertain death at this point, Jake fills us in on everything that's been going down. In particular, the new animorph David, who is not fitting in super well with the group and the blue cube he found. What's interesting here is, I don't know if it was me reading it badly, or if it was the way the book was worded, but I was utterly convinced in the last book that Vissa 3 had acquired the DNA of the president. But Jake's introduction to this book makes that less clear, so maybe it wasn't the president? Keep it together, I said, trying to sound like the leader I supposedly am. The entire human race depends on us winning this battle. Poor human race, Marco said. Feels about right. They get into the sand dunes, where all good things can happen, and they demorph, which is a pretty standard experience for everyone except David, who doesn't have a morphing outfit because he shouldn't have been invited, and he's now nude. Tobias flaps off and borrows some clothes from a Kahuna beach shop. Jake is determined that they will pay for them at some point. But once again, David shows a, should we say, concerning attitude towards ethics? You know, it would be amazing, David said. What would be? I asked. He shrugged. Us, with our powers. We could take anything we wanted. We could, like, morph into cheetahs or whatever, run into some jewellery store, grab the diamonds and get away at 60 miles an hour. What could anyone do? We'd be out of there. Plus, we'd morph back to humans. Of course he's just kidding. Of course. It definitely doesn't feel like when people make a really sexist joke and then you call them out on it and they're like, oh, I was just, I was just kidding. Of course I'm not like that. Mm. Mm. But anyway, back to the plan. Because there was a plan, they need to get into the hotel resort where these world leaders are all meeting. To do that they're going to need to be in Morph, obviously, but it would be a bit weird to have all of these birds of prey there. Thankfully, there is a bird that is found all over the beach. It's seagull morph time. David has no seagull morph because he shouldn't be invited, and he offers to morph eagle and snatch one out of the air, but Jake quite sensibly sends Tobias instead. I was going in with no plan, no clue, and a new guy I wasn't totally used to yet. How would this guy do in battle? How would he do when it got really rough? He'd done okay when we were roaches being chased around, he hadn't panicked, but things could get worse. They could get way worse. I mean, he did panic, that's part of why the plan went wrong. But sure, let's forget about that and keep him part of this. After a very short flight, which made me very hungry because I read this section before I had had a chance to have lunch, they do spot some secret service agents, but they manage to get past them and into the resort, which thankfully has a lot of seagulls in it. There are some security guards around and Jake spots that some of them do have canine units, which makes me happy because dogs, and I thought we were gonna get a dog morph at this point, but he reasons that actually there's probably no way they can fake being trained security dogs. It's also an issue because they need to demorph and then they would be seen by everyone to be giant half seagull beings, you know. They're slowly working through their list of morphs to see if any of them are going to work to sneak them into the hotel when Jake suddenly feels a wave of agony that seemed to sizzle and fry every cell in my body. So it's not great. About 50 feet away from them is a security man who's staring at them with his sunglasses, which Axe theorises are very low powered draken beams that he is firing like he's in Men in Black or something uh, because they need to chase off the seagulls because the Yeeks know that any of the seagulls could be Andalites but they don't want to leave an enormous pile of dead seagulls to sort out, so they're just sort of pinging them away. Cassie gets hit, David also, they both fly away, and then the guy aims for Jake again. I flew away, following the others, and feeling that maybe the free world really was doomed this time around, because as far as I could see, we were beat before we even got started. I mean, maybe the next 20 plus books are just about the Yik overlords. I don't know. They all head home. David goes to Cassie's house because his home, both literally and metaphorically, was destroyed by the Yicks in the previous book. Jake heads home to two very worried parents, which is odd because as far as they're concerned he was just out with Marco, so why are they so worried? But no, it turns out that they 
Ayav, parents with bad news, and initially Jake thinks it's about his brother Tom, who as we all know is a controller, but no. It's your cousin, Sadler. He was riding his bike and was hit by a car. He's alive, but the injuries are very severe. He's in intensive care. This is very sad and very troubling, but Jake doesn't know Sadler very well. At the moment, his biggest concern is that his plans to save the universe are going to be put out by having to travel to see this cousin. But it turns out that his parents are just heading out of town. They're gonna be leaving Jake and Tom on their own for a few days before Sadler moves in with them and brings his family along too, because I don't really know why. It's not 100% explained. I guess they need extra help and care. Maybe it's nearer to a hospital. I can't remember. That pretty well froze the blood in my veins. Sadler has three siblings, Justin, Brooke, and Forrest. Forrest is two years old and is basically the devil. I'm exaggerating, but only slightly. Okay. <laughs> Jake is in a bit of a guilt spiral, both about feeling like he's not caring enough about the fact that his cousin is injured, and also that he's not doing enough for the fate of the world. So he decides to do some probably long overdue research. He hops on the web and he starts googling these world leaders that are coming to the summit. Then I saw it, an article about the new Prime Minister of France, the one whose wife always, always, always travelled with her two chihuahuas. Now that could be useful. Are we going to have a revisit to book two and impersonating pets? I'm excited if that's the case. As Jake is doing this research, his brother Tom sticks his head round the door. Is it the yik spying on Jake, or is it just Tom wanting Jake to get off the computer because he needs to use the phone? Ah, oh, memories. If they remade these books, what would be the equivalent problem that you would have to have? Like, stop hogging the bandwidth? I don't know. He closed the door. Had he seen what was on my screen? Probably not. Even if he had, so what? So I was interested in the French government. Yeah, that made sense. What with my lifelong interest in European heads of state. This is your sign to get diverse hobbies in case you ever need to explain away your spy research. The phone rings and it's Cassie letting Jake know in creative code in case Tom is listening in that David has gone missing. So Jake waits long enough for his brother to check in on him and see that he is definitely asleep and then zips into Batmorph and flies over to the barn to meet with the others. Nobody knows where David has gone or whether he even left in human form or in a morph. The others are going into Owl Morph to search for Axe and Tobias to see if they can help. Jake is going to morph into his dog Homer to see if he can sniff the guy out. My legs bent and shrank till I fell forward onto pads that had replaced my palms. My tail wagged and I felt that amazing rush of giddy idiot dog happiness. Oh, to be able to morph dog. Cassie gives Jake slash Homer a t-shirt of David's that he wore the day before so they can sniff him out and sure enough it would seem that David did walk away from the barn. Following the trail of David like a dog-based Aragorn, Jake discovers that David did in fact go to the middle of a field where he then morphed lion. They follow that scent joined by Rachel and Tobias, they haven't managed to find Axe for whatever reason, only to find that David then morphed again, this time to Eagle, very near a major road. It would seem our David was missing Creature comforts feels like the wrong word here. Anyway, he set himself up in a holiday inn without paying. I pointed at the broken window we'd spotted from outside. You broke a window to get in. David smirked. Hey, a bird broke a window, okay? A bird used a rock to dive bomb the glass. Is that a crime? I don't think so. Officer, arrest that eagle. That's not happening. So safe to say David is not dealing well with the revelation that he can't just amble around as himself because the controllers are actively looking for him. They know he has the cube. So Jake reluctantly brings out the big guns. I don't want to come down on you, but the way it is, is like this. You want to go around using your powers in selfish ways? Then we can't have you around. You're just a danger to us and you're against what we stand for. So the threatening slash disciplining of David is done and they meet the next day without David to discuss Cassie's plan for which morph is going to get them into the resort. The answer is of course bugs but new bugs because none of the ones they have have the right abilities. They need basically decent eyesight and good flying and all that stuff. The answer is dragonflies. Or should I say dragonfly? Seven dragonflies would be pretty suspicious, so Cassie's suggestion is that one of them morphs dragonfly and the rest of them morph fleas and hang on to the back of the dragonfly while they fly into the resort. And this will probably work so long as the fleas hang on with their legs and their mouths. You're a very disturbing person sometimes, Cassie, Marco said. Yeah. And yet she's the one who's come up with a decent plan. They draw straws to see who is going dragonfly and Jake is the chosen one. The first things that had morphed were my eyes. I was standing there, big as my normal self, normal everywhere, except for the fact that my entire head, everything but my mouth, was covered with two monstrous, bulging, iridescent insect eyeballs. Ah! I commented calmly. Dragonfly instincts, for those wondering, basically boil down to, I want to eat mosquitoes. <laughs> Jake gets halfway through consuming one of those boys and then he snaps back into reality. The view back along my body showed my long blue-green abdomen and crouching on my abdomen, sitting like creepy passengers in disorderly rows, were five fleas. I have absolutely no idea why, but this feels very wholesome to me. Like, like a school bus, but a dragonfly. I don't it works. But they can't stay that way for too long because it took so long to get the fleas onto Jake's back because fleas aren't very good at aiming, I guess, that they only have 20 minutes of morph left to get inside the resort. Another excellent part of planning on the fly, how are they going to get inside without being spotted? Well, they're going to go under a bellman's hat 
when he tips it, hover under there, and when he tips it again, they'll go in. This is a terrible idea, but they did come up with it literally on the fly, so... Someone in this world rolled a natural 20 because the plan works. They zip through the air conditioning system minutes before they're going to be stuck as a dragonfly and a bunch of fleas forever, only to be caught by a spider because they cannot catch a break. <laughs> I'm demorphing, David cried. No, I roared, you'll be crushed inside this duct. What a beautiful sentence. So Jake starts to demorph, which pulls them out of the web because he gets so much heavier. And ugh, this is a little bit gross, so if you're a bit squeamish, just skip ahead a few seconds. Uh, but basically, when he started to demorph, he suddenly had human arteries, and the change in pressure caused Flea Cassie to, um... Well, the original text says it burst Cassie's insides. So all everything's going on. Jake morphs back to Dragonfly now they're free of the web, zips through the air conditioning a bit more, flies through a vent, and they all demorph on the floor of the ballroom. Marco can't demorph. Maybe he's left it too long? I don't know. He can sort of morph a bit in that he's become a giant flea. So Cassie, fully demorphed because she's the best, goes over to help him out. Come on, Marco, Cassie said calmly. Clear your mind of all of the fear. You can do this. You will morph. Focus on the picture of yourself. Form the picture in your mind. Let go of the fear and focus on the picture of your own body. Axe says it's pretty much impossible, but Cassie has saved the day. And also stopped Marco from living his life as a giant flea, which, you know, pretty solid. So where are they? In the corner of the ballroom? Yes. But also next to what appears to be a portable yik pool. No way, Rachel said, even as she began to morph into a grizzly bear. Someone would have noticed. There are security guys everywhere. I mean, if there's anything this book has taught me, it's that uh, the security in everywhere are pretty unobservant. But in this case, the yiks have disguised the yik pool as another pillar with a hologram. And the animorphs are now stood inside that hologram. Time for a battery change. The angle may change slightly. And we're back. So, so thank goodness we have Axe to explain the science here. Here is what I believe is happening. The yiks precisely targeted a dragon beam from a cloaked ship overhead. They burned down through the roof and through the column, precisely wiping it out. Then they aimed a holographic emitter of enormous power down through the hole to replace the pillar they had vaporized. A hologram strengthened by a force field. The force field directs its force outwards, of course. We can step out of this hologram at any time, but we would not be able to step back in. The Geeks presumably have a control device that they can use like a car door opener to get in and out of the hologram. Jake leaves the force field to confirm, only to have to dive under a table as three people enter the room. The president and the other heads of state will rise from their seats and travel down along the table, past the photographers and around the back of the pillar, then up onto the podium. Tony, that doesn't make sense, the other man said. Yeah, Tony, I think you might have a different slug-based agenda. Okay, yes, this confirms it. So this is the person, Tony, that they saw Visser 3 take DNA from. And he is in fact not the president, but is the White House head of protocol, and obviously now on the side of the Yicks. Axe telepathically lets Jake know that they found a way out. They can go up where the force field is weaker and get out. But should they kill the Yicks in the pool first? It would be easy to finish them off right there and then. But if we did, the Yicks might simply be able to replace them, and they'd be warned that we knew their plan. This rationalisation is quickly followed up by another in hindsight comment from Jake the narrator. Some decisions are smart, some are dumb. Some manage to be a little of both. This was one of those. This was one of all of your decisions, Jake. They need to get out. They need to get out onto the roof and get into Seagull Morph and get away. But how to do that when the roof has security on it? They need a distraction. David, who has apparently done this little misdemeanor before, suggests pulling the fire alarm. Everyone start to morph to Seagull. David, you have to throw it and come running straight back. No duh. Well, apparently yes duh, because David slips on the way back and he has to dive under a table while a bunch of controllers run in because obviously their first plan is check the yik pool. Instant decision time. Everyone finish morphing and get out of here. Now, I'll get David. David, unhelpful as ever, is morphing to lion. If I could keep David from doing anything crazy, we'd get out of this okay. The controllers just had to check the concealed yik pool and see that their brothers were alive. Get the feeling that's a pretty hefty if there, Jake. The controllers confirm that the yiks in the pool are alive and therefore wrongfully assume there is no andalite penetration. Their words, not nine. But Jake now has Lion David to deal with and grabs hold of his mane to stop him attacking them, potentially opening himself up to losing a limb or worse. But David's like, haha, no, I, I'm in control of this, it's all fine. I really dislike David. I know I meant to, like that's the point of the book, but I really do. So the best way for these two to get out is probably the way they came in. So this time Jake says to avoid the faff of you having to hop about and get on my back, bite my back as a human, uh, and then as we morph, you will be biting my back as a flea. This works, let's just laugh at it and move on. <laughs> so while they're out of there, some theories as to why they've decided to morph the White House head of protocol and not just controller him. Boys theorise that this is because it would be so much faff to get 
the White House personnel out in order to get Candrona rays because they have so much security. In which case the real White House head of protocol is out there somewhere being kept kidnapped by the Yiggs. The big goal is to get the president and the others, Marco agreed. They need to get the president under control and then he'll make it possible for them to install a Candrona in the White House itself. They need a Candrona right there. They can't have well-known White House personnel secretly running around to Yik pools. So they didn't make this Tony guy a controller because if the whole scheme fails, he'll be stuck in Washington without access to a Candrona. Being a Yik and planning world domination is a logistical nightmare. Cassie shook her head. Very clever boys, but as usual, you've overlooked a much simpler explanation. That explanation? Ego. Cassie's theory is that Visser 3 wants to morph the guy because he wants to be directly involved so he can claim all of the credit. Personally, I think it's a little bit of both. They need to nip home uh, just to check in with their parents, make sure they don't get grounded forever. Doesn't necessarily work in all of those cases, except for Jake who lets the others know about his cousin and the fact that his parents are going to be out of town for a bit. This prompts another unsettling David moment. Everyone made the right noises of sympathy, so did David. But while his mouth was making the right words, I saw something disturbing in his eyes, something I couldn't quite put my finger on. I glanced at him and he looked at me with a face that seemed to be shining with restrained excitement, like someone who had just figured out how to win the lottery, and I heard an echo of Cassie's words in my mind. It's always about character. Great. Cassie and Jake get together to talk about this David issue, but it's not super productive conversation. So instead they talk about the plan. Because remember, they don't just want to save the world leaders from getting Yiks put in their head, they also want to confront the world leaders with what's going on. They want them to learn the truth that the Earth is under attack, which totally undermines the Yik plan. So since we have this hologram that is stronger at the bottom than it is at the top because of the way that the beams are focused, I don't know, science, the best thing that they can do is get into that hologram and knock out the controllers who are inside and wait for the world leaders to come through and be like, hello, we have saved your life. Please play along and pretend you have a controller in your mind. By the way, this is a controller. The world is under attack. Thank you so much. Except in French and Russian and stuff. And also work out which one of them is already a controller because they know that one of them is, they just don't know which one. Have I mentioned that this is insane? Marco said. Yeah, I think you may have, I said. Have I mentioned that of all the insane things we've ever done, this is so insane that it makes all previous insanity seem sane? If I had better editing skills and also access to all of those old files, I would have a montage of all the various insane plans they have tried so far, but just imagine it yourself. So they are high above the resort, flapping around in bird of prey morph, all except Marco, who is in snake form. Rachel is holding Marco as a snake. The others are all holding weights, which makes flying a little bit harder, but hey, worth it for part of the plan. I will go first, Axe said. If I appear to run into an invisible wall and I'm knocked unconscious and fall towards the ground, you will know that the force field is still too strong at this height. <laughs> Thanks, Axe. So there are three controllers within the hologram who quickly find themselves set upon by birds with weights. They knock out the controllers, all of which is in sight of, but they don't get seen by the hundreds of people filling the ballroom. Concerning now is that the president is in the ballroom in a tuxedo, but just a minute ago, Cassie thought she saw him walking across the gardens in shorts. It's probably just her being mistaken about who the president is, right? So the guys pinch the suits from the controllers and acquire their DNA. Interesting note, we've discussed in the past, the animals are averse to morphing into people because they feel like it's a bit of a violation, it puts them too close to the yiks. But given that these guys have yiks in their minds at the moment, it's probably fine. Don't think about it too hard, it's okay. The French Prime Minister walked towards us around the back of the pillar and walked straight on by, up to the podium. We looked at one another in confusion. So is the French Prime Minister the one who is a controller? Uh, hopefully. But then it happens again with the Russian Premier and yeah, this is a trap. For a moment, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't think, I couldn't even breathe. I just stood there reeling. Then I realized I knew one thing at least, battle morphs now, I hissed. Oh, sorry, battle morphs now. A hologram inside a hologram. That's what's happened here. Visa 3 steps through the hologram of the Russian premiere and reveals that the ballroom is in fact empty. Well, it's not empty. It's got a whole bunch of hawk bajir in it. By the way, Visa 3 gloated, the real banquet is tomorrow night. I assume he then does an evil laugh. I'm going to put one in. <laughs> <laughs> Fissa 3 demands that the six of them demorph. He wants six more andalites that he can make into controllers because they're super handy. Wait, six? He hasn't spotted Snake Marco. I felt like my brain was working in slow motion. Visser 3 didn't see Marco, his hawk didn't seem to be looking at Marco, and Visser 3 was still planning to go after the heads of state, all of which meant... what? David starts screaming, you know, I'll demorph, I don't care about these people, but Cassie interrupts him by biting on his leg because she's the best character. Hang on a minute. How did they get hawk in here when the animal struggled getting a dragonfly and six fleas through the door? Oh yes. It's a hologram within a hologram within a hologram. But David is over by Visser 3 demorphing because he's a 
useless coward. In a moment, Visser 3 is going to know he's a human. Wait, no, he's going back to Lion again. And Snake Marco confirms that the Hawk Bajir are holograms. A fight breaks loose, but this time, instead of Animorphs versus Animorphs, which is what Visser 3 was trying to prompt, it's Animorphs versus Visser 3. And a dozen human controllers who do leap through the projection because, yeah, they could get humans in, just not, not the giant creatures covered in knives. The Visser wasn't ready to give in. He'd gone to a lot of trouble to catch us. He'd taken a big risk. And you don't get to be Visser of the Year Empire without being determined. Which of you is the human? Yeah, we remember Visser 3 knows that one of them is human because David emailed him. So he knows that one of them is a human boy named David and he knows what he looks like and everything. He pushes David's buttons like the perfect supervillain. You know, David, you'll get to see your family. You'll be able to walk around outside again. We're not gonna hurt you, David. Don't worry about it. Just come over to the dark side. Before David can answer, the controllers confirm that there are actual humans coming. So they need to work fast. Come over to us, David. Go to your old home. We'll watch for you there. Come over to us. We'll make you powerful, safe. So the animal fly home and the atmosphere is understandably a little bit prickly. David makes out like he was just faking out Visser 3 but the others aren't buying it. One by one I contacted Tobias, Axe and Cassie. The message was the same. No one disses David. We all accept his story. We all play along like we believe it. Okay what's the plan here Jake? Jake gets home and makes a convincing enough show to Tom that he's been home all night leaving some dirty dishes around etc. Pretends to have gone to bed and then he morphs Owl and flies out to the barn. He's freezing cold so he climbs into a truck because uh, he just is cold and he falls asleep because he's not great at this. Thank goodness Axe was also keeping an eye out. This is Axe he said, in as loud a thought speak as he could manage. We have an eagle leaving the barn. They send Tobias after him and they follow. The relative speed of birds is not something I want to go into here but is relevant to this. But then Tobias goes missing, he stops thought speaking back to them. Has David attacked Tobias? If so, I'm never forgiving him. They get to David's house which has a UPS truck outside that is almost certainly filled with hawk -Bajir. Yes, this is a trap but maybe David is savable so Jake has to try. It was a strange scene inside. The battle we'd fought there had destroyed the walls, annihilated furniture, left the place looking like a house that's been demolished. But someone had dragged the bed back into place. It faced a television set. The set was on, but the picture was dim and snowy. A golden eagle stood on the upright bedpost, watching the TV screen. And that's when I saw the other bird. A crumpled mass of feathers lay atop a wadded up sheet. Blood had seeped into the material. Oh heck no. David says, I'm definitely not turning myself over to the Yicks. I'm not coming back to you. And that bird is definitely dead. And also he's not gonna be pushed around by Jake and the others anymore because in his words, he feels like the new kid, and he is the new kid to be fair, uh, but in the school with the popular clique. You murdered Tobias because you think this is some stupid school thing, I yelled. Murder? I don't think so, Jake, he said with a laugh. He's a bird. You may kill a bird, but it isn't murder. I would never do that. I wouldn't hurt a human, but hey, an animal, that's a different story. Wow, okay, uh, I saw this coming, but I thought it was gonna be subtle. So David's plan, he's not turning himself over to the Ix. His plan is to acquire a human morph that he can then be in for up to two hours. So then he can wander around the world, provided he goes inside every two hours or so. And he even has a person in mind. Yeah, this cannot go well. If the Yerks don't get you, we will, I said. Yeah, I know, David acknowledged, but already there used to be six of you and now there are just five. Pretty soon, Jake, it'll be four. My word, this kid is not nice. David in mid-morph, he's trying to morph out and Jake takes advantage of the fact that he's not very experienced in morphing. And Jake the bird fight it out in the room, which only draws the hawk Bajir in. So to avoid the hawk Bajir, David, who has bird Jake attached to his face, leaps out of the window. They're on the ground. There's absolutely no way they can get airborne in time to escape the hawk Bajir who've just leapt out the window like it was no problem. But Axe leaps over the fence, distracting them long enough for him to grab Jake and run away. The hawk Bajir are going after the Andalite. They ignore David. The hawk Bajir do also fall into the pool, which would be funny if I wasn't so darn tense. Jake sees the eagle fly off and leaps into the air to chase him, but not after sharing the revelation that he's pretty sure that David has killed Tobias. That would be a most terrible thing, Axe said. Yeah, get Rachel. If David's killed Tobias, we may have to do a terrible thing too. Get Rachel. Where does Eagle David run to or fly to? The mall. Again, I could make the joke, but I'm way too tense. They're on the mall roof and Jake morphs to Tiger, letting those predator instincts take over. You never answered me, Jake, he said. Lion versus Tiger, who do you think will win? I think we need epic battle music at this point, so I will see if I can find any. They battle, biting, fighting, scratching, kicking, all of the things. My favourite sentence from this battle. Like lightning I was up on my feet, fast as only a cat is fast, with liquid speed and vicious grace. I was up, but the lion too is cat. They roll across the roof and suddenly Jake starts to slip, realising that he's not on the grippy surface of the roof anymore, he's on a skylight. With nothing for his claws to grip on, David launches at him and they fall through the glass. In midair, twisting to get my feet beneath me, I felt the teeth, I felt them sink into my neck, I felt the blood gushing, the tiger's blood, my blood, falling, falling and already the darkness, the darkness.
to be continued because these books hate me and they hate you and this series is going to be the death of me. Will Tobias live? I'm hoping so. I assume so. Like surely, surely Tobias lives. This is not, no, I refuse to acknowledge it if he is dead. I'm gonna insert him in every book like he is not dead. Uh, that's what's gonna happen. It'll be fine. <sighs> we will be back next month with installment number three. I haven't read it yet, which is why I'm very tense, but I will get to it as soon as I humanly can, I hope. <sighs> Continuing on, I still hate David. Uh, I think I hate him even more now, so that'll be fun. I'm interested to see how they solve the problem because I don't think they can make the Animorphs murderers yet. I'm pretty sure they're gonna end up being murderers by the end of the book, like righteous killing and stuff, uh, by the end of the series even. But I feel like we're too close to the middle at the moment. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you have enjoyed this uh, or that it has in some way made you feel uh, happy that you are not a person with morphing powers who has to deal with people like David, but maybe you do have to deal with people like David, in which case I am so sorry. If you haven't already, please do subscribe. It makes me feel loved and appreciated and it motivates me to continue on with this series even though I am very, very, very stressed about it. Thank you so much for this book. That's all from me and I will see you in the next one. It's got a piece of bloopers now. Death. Jake fills us in on everything's been going. So it's not great, about 50 feet away from so it's not great, about 50 feet away from them. Did I say David's listening in? Well, David is going to go wolf and see if he can, nope, no. Why are you still rotating?